Chambers of the Occult may contain content that might not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome. Episode six. To our podcast. <laughs> yeah. Hey guys. Chambers of the Occult. Woo, that's us. Woo. I'm Alexis. Ah. I'm Jay. I'm Kai. And welcome. Yeah. And welcome. <laughs> <laughs> that was not planned. Uh <laughs> <laughs> um improv you know if if you guys know us yeah. uh, we're big on that so <laughs> <laughs> yes we are Term um, i'm actually jay not alexis if you're listening for the first time <laughs> oh yeah that's so true <laughs> oh i'm alexis uh, yeah i'm kai i'm kai <laughs> <laughs> all right and we've made it to half a dozen we have that's so crazy Yay! I know. We could have a. It's amazing. We could have a chicken. What? A chicken? Half a Can dozen. Can we name what? What are we gonna name it? What? Peckers. Why peckers? Okay. No. Well, uh, why? Where did the term dozen come from? Like, why did we decide a dozen is twelve? I think that goes so facts. beyond my degree. Like, <laughs> like I. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, isn't it logical for like us? You like, we go by fives a lot. Of, like, wouldn't a dozen being like ten just make more sense for things? Like, well, I mean, we have decade, which is like ten, and then we have dozen, which is like twelve. Yeah, but like, <laughs> uh, who decided? Like, you go to the donut shop, right? And you're like, you get a dozen donuts. Who decided that that was twelve? Would it ten like be more sensible of a number? I mean, yeah, decade. Honestly? It is weird to be like, let me get a dozen donuts. But can you imagine going? Well, because we're so used to it nowadays. But could you imagine going? Is like, can I get a decade donuts? <laughs> but that's time wise, though. That's for time. <laughs> that's ten years, that's, though. Yeah, exactly. So you you get a a, a ten year long supply of donuts. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's like the subscription. We come. The subscription service to your local donut shop. <laughs> Subscribe to our dozen donut to our decade. That should be our next business endeavor. Yeah, I was gonna I say <laughs> decade memberships. Yeah. Yeah, I'm that's amazing. Yearly... Amazing start to our podcast. <laughs> Are you tired of those yearly commitments? You don't want to subscribe to them yearly. Try our dozen. <laughs> no, shoot. I can't. It oh my Are god! Are you tired you of going to the donut shop and buying a dozen donuts every week? Well, we've got a solution for you. Uh, <laughs> a decade come plan. on in, check out our new decade plan for our donuts. Yeah, you heard for it the right. Next Ten years, you have a membership. <laughs> I'd pay for it. Everything. I don't know. Honestly, yeah. if it was like a set price, that would not go up. That how much like inflation. okay would it be like would it be like a monthly payment like a yearly pay- payment or that's would it what be i was like, gonna ask uh, like a 10 year long payment i think like if it's... it could be either way like nowadays you can either like pay for your membership for the full year or like month for month <laughs> i want that's, I... That's, that's like a lot of money yeah yeah 10 yeah. years you give like, anyway you give, like, anyway <laughs> uh episode six chambers of the Occult. <laughs> if you want to hear us talk more about our decade endeavor let us know but as, yeah. for, but as of now uh, well <laughs> we start another podcast <laughs> <laughs> all the does call the decade endeavor yeah yeah oh that's actually kind of kind of cool i don't know Rolls yeah it is time. actually <laughs> um <laughs> anyway um hope yes. you guys are doing well everyone listening jay alexis hope you guys are good 
I am doing well. Cool. I mm-hmm. have water. I have coffee because I was feeling sleepy. <laughs> and I am ready. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> I will not. Fall not with this story. In the middle of your story. Oh, wow. You're just going to hear me snoring. Ooh, Dramatic effect. <laughs> yeah. All right. So where do you guys it. feel like going today? Uh, To bed. <laughs> Shoot. Romania. I don't, I, I don't have a bed story plan today. I also don't have a Romanian story plan today. I, so, I sort of have a bed story. Like, there's a bed <laughs> element. To it, okay. Oh, okay. Um, Sing me a lullaby. Doesn't. Interesting. A lullaby? <laughs> cool. So, I'll uh, be telling you pie, a pick. true crime story. And we're not okay, heading to crime. Romania. We're not heading to the bed. We're Aww. heading to... Sorry. Maybe next time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you want us to tell bedtime stories, send us an email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, email me directly. I take commission for um, reading bedtime stories. If you find her Why did you say it that's, like that's, that? That's such a lie. Please don't email me. <laughs> <laughs> You don't take commissions yet. Not yet, at least. Yeah, I still need to get it all set up and everything. Um, <laughs> like cool. those ASMR and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Bye. <laughs> Once upon a time. No way. All right, yeah. Let's, uh, Sorry for let's, the let's of your ears. Let's yeah. stop that right now. Um, I'm taking yeah. you to New Mexico. Before we, before we lose <laughs> listeners. Oh, New Mexico. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm going to take you away from bedtime stories and take you to Mexico. Away. Okay. Well, uh? So we're going to go back in time. Yes. Whoa. And we're going to go to to back in time. Because Whoa. that's Whoa. very specific. I love that place. <laughs> that's crazy. So we're going to Belen, New Mexico. Okay. And okay. that's where Tara... Calico was born. Have you heard of Tara? No, but I know what a Calico is. <laughs> her last name, too. <laughs> I have not heard of her. Mm-hmm. So she was born on November. Sorry. Whoa. February. Big difference. <laughs> Jesus. She was born on February 28, uh, 1969. She's a Pisces, if you're interested. <clears throat> And she lived in Belen, New Mexico with her mom, Patty Dole, and her stepdad, John, and her stepsister, Michelle. And that's it for the family. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and th- they live in the Rio Grande uh, suburb community. So Tara was very active. She was very active in high school. She did track, cheering, um, and at this point, she had already graduated, and she was attending the University of New Mexico in Valencia. And she was so active after high school. She liked to play tennis, and she liked to go on bike rides. Okay. Yeah, so it yeah. was um, okay. the morning uh, of Tuesday, September 20th of 1988, when she told her mom, Patty, that she was going to go on for a bike ride. And this wasn't out of the normal. She was a very active girl. Um but Tara's bike had a flat tire from a few days ago. So Tara just asked her mom if she could take her um, her hot, pink, huffy 10-speed bike. And the mom said, yeah, take it. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> so Patty tells her mom that she... Well, Patty starts getting ready. It's Patty. Patty's the mom, sorry. Patty agrees to let her, Tara take the bike. And around 9.30 in the morning, Tara's getting ready to head out. And she tells her mom, Patty, that she'll be back around 11.30. And that's because Tara already had plans laid out for that day. After her back bike ride, she had plans to go meet with her boyfriend. And after that, she was going to have a tennis game followed by some college classes. Okay. So it was a busy day. <clears throat> also, Tara told her mom that if um, she wasn't back by noon, that she should come get her. And that wasn't out of the normal, just because in case Tara lost track of time, she still had plans, so she had to do places. Um, and she was good at timekeeping, but in case, you know, she missed, her, you know, missed time her bike ride or something, she still wanted to be able to make it. So she told her mom, like, hey, keep an eye on the time. If I'm late, come get me because I have plans. 
Mm-hmm. So she says goodbye to her mom. Uh, she turns on her Walkman and she sets off on her usual route. Now, Tara was, uh, Tara was a very active cyclist who went on lots of bike rides. Um, it, it was almost daily that she went on bike rides and sometimes her mom would join her. But this time she was just going on her own. So this route that she took included, um, it was a long stretch of the New Mexico State Road 47. And it was near her home, so it wasn't too far. Um, but this rides were a part of her regular exercise regimen. Um, and she was known to be very disciplined about her cycling. Okay, so she was she was big on cycling. <clears throat> yeah. 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 My brother used to she... be a cyclist. Ah. What happened? Are you talking uh, about he he still is. Like he still yeah. like he still loves to ride bikes and has like a bike collection, but he is okay. not as into it anymore. Okay. He'll collect them. He just won't write them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't Tara. Mm-mm. Yeah. So um Patty didn't actually like the route that Tara was taking because um it was kind of isolated once you get outside of the neighborhood. Plus, one of the days that Patty was biking with Tara, uh, Tara um, she swears that they were being followed by a driver. And that kind of freaked Patty. Oh. Patty's the mom. Pa- her Kind of yeah, freaked yeah. her out. And it freaked her out enough to, like, not go on a bike ride. Through I that, mean, completely you know? valid. Yeah. 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 So she b- brought it up to her daughter. She's like, hey, Tara, like, at least carry mace and, like, don't take that route if you can avoid it. But Tara was already an adult. She was 19 at the time. And she told her mom that she was overthinking things, that it was a safe community, it was a safe place, and she felt comfortable, and that she was 19, not nine. So Patty, the mom, of yeah. course, didn't like her response from her daughter, but she said that she already voiced her concerns and that, that there's not much that she could do because her daughter's an adult. Yeah. yeah. So that morning, 11.30 wrong, uh, comes around, and that's the time that Tara told her mom that she would be home and she's not home. So Patty's not too worried yet because, you know, maybe she'll be five minutes late and, you know, everything's fine. 15 minutes late, like things like that happen. It's not until noon, just half an hour after 1030, where she was originally supposed to show up that like Patty starts to worry. So this was also before like phones. So Patty decides to just go look for Tara, just like Tara told her. Yeah. Yeah. And Patty knew exactly where to look because, like I said before, they had biked that route often together. Um, mm-hmm. And it was a simple route. Um, they took it every every day. It was a 17-mile stretch along the uh, road 47 heading southeast out, um, out to the railroad tracks away from the community. Um, and then 17 miles back. So Patty drives up there hoping to get a glimpse of the pink bike, or maybe she got a flat tire, but there's no sign. So she starts driving back, hoping that when she gets home, Tara's already home. But by Uh this time, when Patty gets home, she becomes even more worried because Tara's not there. There's no sign of that pink bike. So together with her husband, John, they call the police uh, to report her missing. And right off the bat, law enforcement takes this very seriously. um, And search efforts begin that very Tuesday that she went missing. When when was all of this again? Like so this was in 1988. Okay. All right. Yeah. So there was definitely like concern, lots of concern about safety and things. Mm-hmm. Um, what did the the police like end up doing? I guess. So no, that's a good question because after they told the police, um, the family, um. I mean, they told him what happened, and the police took the family's word um, right off the bat that this was really okay. out of character for her. That's good. That's good. Yeah. 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 Especially because, I mean, I'm sure the family explained it's like, hey, it's not just like her usual bike ride. She has school, a tennis match, and she has plans to meet with her boyfriend. It's not like it was the only thing she had planned for the day. Yeah. So the first, I don't know how much you know when someone goes missing, but the first 48 hours are really crucial to locate the missing person. They are. Yeah. Because after those 48 hours, the chance of finding the person just dramatically drops. Yeah. So it was actually really great that the police got on the case right off the bat. And they're like, she's missing. Tell us what happened. 
they explain the story. And they're like, okay, we're going to start searching. So Good. the Valencia County Sheriff, yeah, they called help from other departments across New Mexico, which right off the bat is something that's great because that's not normally the response the average person get has with police when someone goes missing. Um, so they had uh, bloodhounds. They had a res- search and rescue team. They had ATVs. Um, and it actually pays off. Mm-hmm. Oh, because, that's really yeah. good. Yeah. So that's, that's what, once again, why like the first 48 hours are super important because yeah. the first day, like the very first day, the, the very same day, day that she goes missing, they find some vital clues. They find some bicycle tracks. Um, so they follow the bicycle tracks, but unfortunately they don't lead to Tara, uh, Tara or her bike. Now they also find uh, tire marks from a car. Um, and that seems oh. to, mm-hmm. they find tire marks and then they find a um, broken tape player that matches the color of Tara's cassette tape. Oh, that's an interesting find. Yeah, so it's not like just tire tracks. It's like this is the cassette tape from her. Uh, the band was uh, called Bo- Boston. I don't know if you've heard of that band before or not. I don't. I don't think so. Maybe I don't look into them because I kind of just got intrigued by the story. Mm-hmm. But okay. I mean, Tara liked them, <laughs> so that's how they know that you know, like this, or they're connecting some dots. They're already finding some crucial information the first day that she went missing. Um, the police talk to people around. They get a couple of witnesses that they do say that they saw a woman cycling that matched Tara's description. Um, there was also a pair of ranch hands who said that they saw her saw her heading north around 1030 a.m. Um, and that would have been around the time that she would actually be bi- uh, cycling on her way home. Mm. So. Um, Tara's family works to collect volunteers for the search party. Um, but unfortunately, because she went missing on Tuesday, um, on Wednesday, um, the next day, the, the weather is actually really bad. Um, and mm. the air search had to be grounded. Yeah. So they no longer had eyes mm. on the sky. That it was also rainy and windy. Understand. Yeah. And because it was rainy and windy weather, um, it made it even more difficult because all the evidence that they've been trying to find um could have been washed away or blown yeah. away um they did keep collecting more people for search parties um she went missing on tuesday by friday they had over 200 people helping find tara damn that's yeah. that's really good yeah that's awesome yeah so everyone you know in the neighborhood and people that you know friends family started to like come forward and help out now, the police kept doing their job and talking to more people. And several more witnesses came along that they say they saw Tara being followed by an older um, model pickup truck with a shell camper. Um, the same witnesses say that they saw Tara with her headphones on, on. So she wasn't aware that she was being followed by whoever was in that truck. So... Okay, so they they came to that conclusion that, like, she was being followed and everything. Yeah, Um, I mean, at least that's what the witnesses said. Yeah. And because that's the only thing they have. Um, So they keep searching, but unfortunately, months would go on with with the search parties coming out empty-handed. And the grace and the case um, grows cold. Hmm. Did it... I know you're going to get into it, but, like, did it... Did it stay cold for a while or? Great question. No. (laughs) So she disappeared in September of 1988. By 1989, there was already new leads. Oh, okay. So a a year. Yeah, yeah, so on... Wait, I think that was a typo on my part. I am so sorry. Oh, that's okay. um, she would miss it in 1988. There's no leads until 1980, 1999. Oh. Oh, 10 years. Oh, yes. God. Okay, so it did kind of go cold for a while. Yeah. Yes, for 10 years. Um, however, this is not what you would expect. Um, 10 years later, I mean, almost 10 years, 
on yeah, ten years on June uh, twelfth, nineteen sorry, eighteen ninety nine. Um, what am I saying? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hold on. <laughs> We're not going back in time. I'm like 19 and now I'm going 18. I did a typo okay. with, with the numbers. <laughs> 1989. It was the following year. Wow. Talk about poor note taking. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it was one year. It was one year. <clears throat> it was one the year. The year after. Okay. Yes. Um, there's this one. <sighs> okay. So, remember how she went missing in. New Mexico? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're taking a trip now. We're oh. going to North Florida. What? Oh, whoa. Yeah. yeah. That's like across the country. It really is. <clears throat> um, so on June 12th, 1989, there's this woman in a convenience store that's all the way in uh, Port St. Joe in North Florida. And she's in the parking lot of this convenience store and she sees a white van. With the guy in the driver's seat, no one on the passenger side. So the woman goes inside. She buys the stuff that she needs. And when she comes out of the store, the van is gone. And she sees that where the van used to be, there's now a Polaroid picture laying on the ground. Oh. oh. So this woman picks up the picture and she took a look at it. And what she found in that picture was so shocking she had it reported to the police right away. Uh huh. Oh god. Yeah. So, ah, okay. So I want to tell you what's in the picture, but I'd rather just show you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna send you that Polaroid picture. Okay. So, uh, I sent it to the group chat, so feel free to take a look at it. <clears throat> oh. Well. Yeah, so that Polaroid picture um, showed two people, a young woman and a young boy, who are both bound and seemingly gagged, lying in the back of a van or a similar enclosed space with a dark interior. <clears throat> um, the woman is seen with a duct tape over her mouth, suggesting that she's been gagged, uh, and her hands are behind her back, which could indicate that they're tied or bound, and her expression and her position and her body language are kind of like just a little bit of in, in distress. Yeah. I mean, you can see the picture. Um, the woman who found the picture um, described the man that was in the van, and she said that he was like a 30 year old man with a mustache. It was very vague. It was the only thing they had. Um, so they set up a roadblock, but there were no clues. And after six weeks, with the police having no answers about this Polaroid picture in Florida, they asked the public for help. So they released the picture. They were asking for help. Um, and back in New Mexico, John and his family hear from one of the, John's friends about the picture. Because a friend told John that's like, hey, I just saw your daughter in the news. And John is kind of like, what do you mean you saw my daughter in the news? So as soon as the family sees the picture, um, they rush down to Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Of and when, yeah, and when this happens, this is where the FBI gets involved. Oh shit! Yeah, because now it, it, it's she's across. If it's her, it's across state lines. Oh yeah. So the FBI steps in as the lead, um, and the FBI send the picture back to the lab for analysis. Um, now the authorities were not sure if it was, if. This was Tara, uh, Tara in the picture. But Patty's, Patty, Tara's mom, she was convinced that this girl in the Polaroid is her daughter. She said that this is what Tara looks like without makeup. And when it's been a couple, um, when it's been a while since she hasn't gotten a perm. In addition to that, she uh -huh. also points to like a scar in the girl's leg that matches the scar that Tara has. Mm hmm. Wow, so like a lot's matching up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sending you a picture right now that's the picture of the the Polaroid and a picture of Tara as well. <clears throat> oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Definitely see that, that, that resemblance. Yeah, so the FBI also sees that there's a book in the picture and they try to blow it up. Um, 
just to see what the book next to the girl is. Um, and the family immediately yeah. recognizes the book because the book next to what people believe it's ter- uh, Tara, um, it's called My Sweet uh, Audrey, Audrey, Audrina by V.C. Andrews. And it turns out that according to the family, that was Tara's favorite book. Oh. So now there's just like a few more things connecting because there's a picture. The family says it's her without makeup, without having a, her hair done in a while. There's yeah. a star. And now book, her favorite everything's book pointing to it next yeah. to her. Yes. So they also notice that there's like a phone number scratched into the book, but not all the numbers were visible in the Polaroid because they got cut off. Um, so the FBI just tries to figure out how many combinations they can be with that phone number. Um, and it's not helpful because there's what? over 300 combinations with those missing numbers. I'm looking at the picture right now, and there's a phone number etched into the book? Yeah, it's hard to see. Whoa. I couldn't find it either, but, like, I know. <laughs> uh-huh. I mean, probably easier to see, like, on the actual I mean, Polaroid. Yeah. It's also hard to see in the picture the name of the book. You can make it out now that I said it, but the yeah. FBI blew it up so they could get a better look, and that's when they noticed the phone number. I see. But with the couple of numbers that were cut off from that phone number, um, it could have been up to 300 combinations possible. Yeah. Yeah. So the law enforcement reached out to the Polaroid companies to get information about the filmed they used since Polaroids were still relatively new during this time. Um, and they wanted to track down where this Polaroid, Polaroid was distributed. So they were able to find out the film for this specific Polaroid ca- uh, Polaroid only became available in May of 1989. So a month oh. before the picture had been taken. Wow. So wow. there, yeah, uh, that's already like a huge like narrow down. It is. So during that whole time, the picture was sent back to the labs, and the labs was Los Alamos National Laboratory um, in New Mexico, which was like a renowned institute. Uh huh. But the reports varied of what they came up with, uh, because according to the Albuquerque t- uh, Tribune back in two thousand three, John and Patty say that um, John and Patty were told by the lab that based on the girl's ears and the hairline, that it was definitely Tara. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So, it. however, um, in 2008, the Albuquerque Journal reports that the lab said it's not her. What? Yeah. So, like, five years after they told and them, how... yes, it's your daughter, five years later, this journal decides to say it's not her. No, like, how? Ha- what? One, like, why are you still looking into who that person is? And well, two, yeah, like, how would it, case would at it this not? Point. That's true. Yeah. They mm-hmm. didn't really say why it's not. They just said that the lab said it wasn't her. But in 2003, John and Patty were told that it was her. Now, there was other labs that were also, like, running, like, analysis on the Polaroid. Um, and... Mm. Uh, the Scotland Yard in the United Kingdom got involved and they did their own analysis of the Polaroid. Whoa. Yeah. So uh, Scotland Yard said in 2006 that this is definitely Tara. What? <laughs> Which is it? I'm going to go with what the lab said just because the lab said yes and then the journal said no. And the journal didn't do their analysis. And also, like the yeah. what, like the family said yes. Like, yeah, yeah. So, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, there would be like no sign of like Tara, Tara or no leads. Um, and unfortunately, in two thousand six, Patty, uh, Tara's mom, passed away. Oh, oh okay. God. So she passed away without knowing where what happened to her daughter, where she was. And in 2008, two years after Patty's death, it's where things get more interesting. So the new Valencia County Sheriff goes on record with a shocking announcement. Um, In an interview with the Valencia County News Bulletin, 
um, that was published 20 years after the terrorist kidnapping. Um, the Valencia County Sheriff, his name is uh, Rene. Whoa. <laughs> oh. I was able to say this earlier, and it's not even Send that hard. Send it to me, I'll say it. Rene, there we go. <laughs> Rene yeah. Rivera, um, so he says that he knows exactly what happened to Tara. Oh, what? Yeah. How so 20 years after know. he goes missing, this new sheriff says, I know exactly what happened to her. Um, and he knows exactly who's responsible. Rene also says that, this two that, that the two suspects... Um, were teenagers back in 1988 when Tara vanished and that they had help. Okay. How long? Okay. It sounds kind of sounds like he's known this for a long time. Why didn't he speak up before? Well, he was at, at this point, it's when he became the new sheriff. Hmm. So hmm. he wasn't a sheriff when it first went down. Um, so he ends up telling. That he says that um, they the teenagers the teenagers had help when Tara vanished because um, they needed help when they got rid of the body. Oh, yeah. Uh, he says that they didn't didn't work alone, and he believes that Tara Calico never left New Mexico alive, not even Valencia County. Wow, and. Why do you know this, sir? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's a whole 360 because a year later, you're like, oh, my God, like she was maybe in Florida. Um. Also, there's never any clues of who the boy in that Polaroid is. Yeah. Like I, they I haven't gonna... been able to like identify him or like have a matching suspect. Um, or like a mass, m missing person case that matches the description of this kid. That's so sad. So um, the theory of the sheriff is that he clarifies that he doesn't think uh, he he doesn't think ta uh, Tara is in the Polaroid, even though the picture of the girl in the Polaroid has never been linked to anyone else's case, just Tara's. Um. Mm -hmm. He said he's been on the case for a long time, since like 96, um, and that he's been used to all kinds of wild goose chases from like tipsters and psychics um, and, every and everything in between. Uh, he yeah. said that he followed a ton of leads and that he dug up multiple places where Tara was rumored to be buried, um, only to come up empty him dead. But that he's now ready to lay out what he believed happened to Tara. So, so what, what did he believe? And like, when did he eventually come out with like more of the information? Yeah. I mean, he didn't speak out of, speak of it publicly until two years after her mother passed away. Okay. Um, and according to, according to the sheriff, um, Rene, uh, these two teenagers were driving along with an, you know, an old pickup. Just how yeah. the witnesses have described that they saw a pickup. Um, and they said that when they saw Tara riding her bike down State Road 47, they decided to follow her. Um, Rene goes to say that this guy is in the truck actually knew Tara. Uh -huh. um, and, and that they were kind of maybe catcalling her or harassing her. Just being jerks. Um, but things took a really bad turn because as they were doing all that, um, they actually hit Tara, uh, Tara's bike with the truck. Um, Damn. <laughs> and Rene says that he does. Yeah, he, Rene says that he thinks that it was an accident. Um, they weren't whoa, trying whoa. to run her over or anything. They were just, you know, like men harassing. Okay, her but like, doing. come on. What did How you that just a straight up accident? I don't know. No, so that's Rene says that he doesn't think that he thinks it was an accident. Um, but when Tara falls off her bike, um, that's when the two teenagers get off the pickup truck and they kind of panic because, oh, my God, we just hit this girl and we know her. She knows us. Um, so they pick Tara up with her bike and they put them in, in the truck. 
Um, so technically, they kind of they abducted her. Um, they yeah. abducted her. Yeah. yeah. The sheriff said that they dumped the bike somewhere along the way, and that uh, Rene, the sheriff Rene, says that he thinks maybe they saw uh, Tara hurt from the fall, and that maybe she was threatening to call the police. So the teenagers, you know, their their brains started to like their heads started to spiral. Um, they panicked, and that's they were afraid that they were going to go to jail, and that's why they put her in the truck. They were that is afraid. a very logical way to handle the situation. <laughs> I would do it's, the same. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> um, you want to put it? No. So <laughs> no. according to Renee, um, in the same interview. Um, he says that when the boys got rid of Tara's body, um, again, remember, I said they didn't do it alone. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't think he has a theory of exactly what happens. He thinks that these guys had help from at least two more people. He thinks he knows th- who they are, but he won't name them formally. Um, and after his interview goes to the press, um, Tara's surviving family waits with this horrible anticipation. You know, they're desperate to see who these two mysterious guys yeah. um, are going to, who are going to be arrested are so the family can finally learn what happened in and they can fill in the, all those pieces. They can mm-hmm. get that closure after 20 long years. Yeah. But this is, the thing is that even the sheriff says that he has a solid case ready. Like he has it put together, uh, but the, that he won't name them um, until he says that he has hard concrete evidence. Like the body, or the bike, or a piece of clothing. So you can imagine this yeah. would just make the family more mad. Yeah. Of course, because how are you gonna go? How are you, the sheriff, gonna go public and drop this bombshell on us? Yeah, and then just let it fizzle. How does this guy even know? You know. Like, where did he get this information from? Yeah, so... uh, Sorry to tell you, but... Nothing comes of this. Tara's family... I know! I know! What the fuck? Tara's family is just, again, left to wait and watch. No arrests happened. No information got released to the public. Tara's disappearance just cools off again. uh, And the investigation continues for a bit as well uh the 20th anniversary of her missing uh, the 20th anniversary of the uh, polaroid comes and goes um nothing happens um so it was when that 20th anniversary came of the polaroid being found um that things started to move again because we're going to go back to Florida now. We're okay. jumping back and forth. I know that place. <laughs> um, and Port St. Joe in Florida, the, the sh- uh, chief of the police himself, um, mm-hmm. he was named David Barnes. Um, he got a pair of images in the mail. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, from who? Yeah, so it's actually a pair of images um, of a boy with a marker drawn over his mouth to look like a duct tape. Um, Mm -hmm. And they were trying to imitate the boy from the original Polaroid. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So now the law investigators, um, they reported these photos that they were postmarked on June 10th, 2009, which was two days before the anniversary uh, when the photo was found. So... They think it's some kind of like joke or they're just trying to be like have a gag or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um but the local newspaper gets the same photo as well. Oh. Um so it's not only Florida that got it, but the local newspapers in Albuquerque also got the photo. Um mm-hmm. and that's when they turn it over to police. Um and the thing is that the girl in the Polaroid and the boy the girl was never 100% positively ID'd as Tara. Um, and after 20 years, uh, the boy has still gone unidentified. 
So the law enforcement enforcers do take it seriously. And at least for a little while, because they're pretty sure that it's just like a joke. Yeah. But what if it's connected? Exactly. Mm-hmm. You have to take that thing, those things seriously. Yeah. Yeah. So unfortunately, nothing happens. The case grows cold and they close the case. These poor kids, <sighs> man. Yeah. Like, so the why go ahead the, why though i like i don't get how some of this information can just be glossed over yeah. and then never like investigated okay. again mm-hmm. no it's actually i mean crazy they never i mean if the sheriff is gonna say she never left the county she died here work with the labs or something i don't know because the picture's the Polaroid, two labs, Scotland Yard, and the one that the FBI sent it to said, this is definitely Tara. But it's not over yet. Because I'm going to give you another turn. Okay. So five years later, um, October 2013, 25 years after Tara vanished. 25 years. Jesus Christ. Uh, That's so long. Yeah. yeah. So little answers. Oh yeah. I mean, with confusing answers at that point. Yeah. yeah. Um, law enforcers announced that they were reopening the case, which what which had fizzled out after Renee's announcement. Um. And I can't even imagine what the families are feeling and going through. Oh yeah, it's a point. roller coaster. Yeah. Overall, I mean. Yeah. It was a year before the Polaroid shows up. The Polaroid shows up. They say it's your daughter. They see the picture. They have hope because, oh, my gosh, she's alive. But where is she? And then years go by before anything else happens. Um, But there was a task force made up of both federal and local officials, which were, like, being assembled to, like, try and finally get get an answer. Um. Mm-hmm. And the Albuquerque Journal um, article says that they were not really interested in solving just um, this case, but they were interested in solving generally just cold cases. Yeah. They were looking to reopen them, look at old evidence, and try to get new evidence with modern technology. Because they had been 25 years. Exactly. Yeah. Like, there's so yeah. much at this point. So later that same October... Um, the case reopened. Members of the task force co- start conducting more interviews in the county, in the Valencia County. Um, and then de- uh, uh, the county sheriff deputy named Frank, um, he tells them about a pretty much a deathbed confession. So um, according to the police report, Frank tells the, poli- uh, the, the task force that a, na- that a man named Henry Brown wanted to confess some things before he died. Oh. And, yeah. And that Henry Brown knew exactly what happened to Tara and who killed her. Okay, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. Dude, I'm dude, telling what? you. You think what it's over, you think on? it's not going to lead anywhere, and there's more, what is like, up years with later. People? What is yeah. wrong with people? They're like, um, yeah. yeah, let me 20 years until I give evidence that would help solve a disability. Yeah, so (laughs) Frank just tells the task force that Henry, the man that had the deathbed confession, um, back in 1988, this is early 2000s, and this confession happened in 1988. Oh my god. Um, He said, Henry told him that in 1988, he used to live down a street from a trailer where this other guy lived. And he said that the other guy liked to have his buddies over to get high and party uh, in the basement that he had built. Um, And Henry would go over to actually party with them. And it all sounds just like fun and games. But the guy um, who lived in the trailer was named Lawrence Romero, uh, Romero Jr., and this was the the old sheriff's son. 
Oh. Oh. <laughs> I literally just processed for me. <laughs> no, we both no, no. at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, um, I know. There's a lot of names. There's been multiple sheriffs that have gone through the county during this whole missing person yeah. process. And it's like they yeah. all know something. Like, yeah. yeah. So Lawrence yeah. Romero Jr. was the old sheriff's son. Um, and Frank tells the task force that Henry, the man in the deathbed, said that he was down in the basement one night, right around the time that Tara disappeared, and that he saw what could be called like a grave wrapped up in blue tarp, basically the size of like a human body. Um, oh, no, and that, yeah, and that th- there were three guys, Lawrence and his buddies, Leroy and David, and one on. But one more unnamed man with like red hair. Um, and that they kind of start talking about how they knew Tara because um, she used to date a friend of theirs. And now that, uh, and how they knew that she took the same bike ride every day and how they have seen her Ooh. on State Road 47 on her usual route. So they were, they knew. Like, yeah. 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 This was planned. Um, And that they were driving this old pickup truck um, and that they knocked her off her bike. But according to Henry, it doesn't stop there. Uh, Because Henry, the man in the deathbed, making his deathbed confession, um, he tells Frank that Lawrence, uh, Leroy, and the redhead and David, um, they kidnapped Tara. Um, They took her out to some um, gravel pits nearby. And sexually assaulted her. Oh. Yeah. So, fuck um, people. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Like, fuck, fuck evil people. Yeah. Literally. No. So, um, um, they, uh, he says that she fought, um, and that even though she had just been like brutalized, um, Lawrence told Henry that she threatened to go to the police. Um, so Lawrence got a knife and stabbed her. Wow. And, and what's the point? Like, why do you need to even do that? People are sick. (laughs) There's no logic. I mean, I'm glad that I don't know why they did what the things they do. Yeah, me too. But. Um, then he says that they put her body in, in the basement. Um, and, uh, and later they took it out of the red head's house, uh, dumping it in a nearby pond. So, uh, here's the thing. Lawrence, um, Lawrence liked to brag that since he was, that since his dad was the sheriff, um, he could pretty get away he could pretty much get away with committing crimes. Yeah. Yeah. So Lawrence was known to like brag about it to people. Um, and as for the pink bike, the group said that they took it to a junkyard where it would never be found. Mm-hmm. Now, unfortunately, by the time that the task force hears this, um, this is years later. This took place literally when Tara went missing. Um, okay. And at this point, Frank has already resigned for the, from the department. Um, and Lawrence Romero Jr. Um, has already been dead for 20 years. Got it. And Henry, the man in the deathbed confession, he had already died as well. So there really wasn't a way to prove or disprove any of this. Yeah. Because everyone but, who, like, had, like, knowledge of it was just dead, basically. Yeah. And it's what's so unfortunate in cases like this. It's like, oh, we have new knowledge now, 20 years. But everyone involved 20 years ago is, is dead. dead. Yeah. Yeah. So um, remember how we talked about that report in 2008? Um, the yeah. one where the sheriff, uh, Rene, comes out and he's like, I yes. solved it. Yeah. Um, so there's some connections between them. He said that there were teenage boys, that they were, had assistant, that the Terrace's uh, bike got hit, and that they put her in the truck. Um, 
Now, also Tara, like, threatening to, like, tell the law enforcement is also, could also contribute to uh, an idea of, like, a cover-up. Uh-huh. Because, of course, like, the dad's not going to want his son to go to jail for murder. Because, yeah, like, definitely. I have a reputation to upkeep. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it feels like we're kind of seeing, like, a cover-up, maybe. Um, it's not... It's not always necessarily about, like, justice. Like, because she got killed, like, there's not going to be justice. Maybe the cop, the sheriff was like, it's more about politics. Like, I have to, like, save my image. You just got to stop mm-hmm. being, like, a dick of a son and stop, <laughs> no. like, stabbing people. No, literally. <sighs> yeah. But even with this story, we really don't have actual evidence of this. I mean, we don't have evidence of anything. We don't know. We don't even know if the law enforcement did confirm this story. Um, so it's it sucks. Um, the most recent update is from 2018. Um, it's from the Albuquerque Journal, and it was just unclear what steps the law enforcement took after this story. And it's unknown whether they searched the pond or the house where, you know, it was said that she was kept in. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So we just have no idea. There's still that photograph. Um, is it really Tara? If if it's not, who is that woman ga- like gag in the back of the truck? And who is that boy next to her? It kind of just... Yes. Like, I, I know that there was more happening behind the scenes, but it just seems like they don't care about the little boy. Yeah. I mean... I didn't want to get too much into it because we can definitely cover this. It's, there's a different story um, okay. of another okay. missing child that they think it's the boy in the picture. But it's never confirmed once again. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But once again, even with this Polaroid, they can't confirm it's Tara. They can't confirm who that kid is. It just feels unknown. Yeah. Um, Michelle, her her sister, is still alive. Um, and she still wants to get the truth. Like, she still wants to know what happened to her sister. Yeah, um, of course. She's actually teamed up with one of Tara's uh, old classmates named M- Melinda. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're interested, or, you know, you listeners, um, they, Melinda and Tara's sister, they have started an investigative podcast dedicated to solving oh. Tara's case. Yes. So I think that's, that's really cool. cool. Yeah. 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 So the sister and the the old classmate, they started this podcast. Um, and in April 2019, Melinda did say that she's gotten some new information that she has turned over to the law enforcement. Um, unfortunately, we don't know what this information is, but it could potentially help solve the case. And Hopefully. back in up. Yeah. I hope so. So it's good to know that, you know, there's still. At least her sister's still searching. And um, mm. back in October 2019, um, the FBI posted that they were offering a $20,000 reward for information about this case and that they can ask an- and that they um, ask anyone with information to please contact them. So if you're a listener and you have some information, just contact them at tips.fbi.gov. Gov? Wow. wow. <laughs> or by calling them at 505-889-1300. So again, like... Did we if... just plug the FBI? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did. I, I nice. mean, if there's... I mean, because it's still an open case. It, like, That's true. It went cold. It got closed. It got reopened. New information came out. And now, like, her sister and her old classmate, Melinda, are working on it. Like, I believe podcasting mm-hmm. about it. Yeah. So that is the sto- the story of uh, Tara Calico. Thank you for sharing the story. Thank you for sharing. I would be so pissed off if I was the family. Oh, they were righteously upset. Yeah. 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 I mean, right. they went through a lot. They did. They really did. I, I can't even imagine what they went through and what they're going through. 
Yeah, I mean, I when it comes to stories of missing people, the thing that gets me the most is when someone passes away without having an answer, like the mom yeah. did. Yeah, she passed away not knowing whether her daughter was still alive or not. Yeah, um, I guess the only kind of twisted bright side was that because she passed away, um, two years later she didn't have to deal with the story of how she, Tara never left New Mexico and she died. So I guess the mom still kind of had that hope that her daughter was out there somewhere. But it's still unfortunate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is. It's, it's like such a terrible thing to learn how many like cold cases there are out there. Yeah. Um, about things exactly like this very similar and it's just such like a morbid reality that mm -hmm. there's so much evil out there yeah. um yeah yeah and i did want to give you guys some stats about like missing people and all that stuff but honestly i couldn't find the stats that i wanted i found a lot of them but not necessarily once related to cases like this yeah that's it was okay. all more of like nowadays and like technology and like yeah but there's a lot of stats out there and you know a lot of people are found but unfortunately that small percentage of people they still have families they still have a story to tell they still had a future yeah yeah well thank you Jane. that's tara thank calico you. Tara you're calico. welcome <laughs> sorry to bring down the mood already no no, no, no. no you're fine because we're gonna pick <laughs> back up again well, because we're going for, okay, we're, <laughs> I was going to be like, that's going to be up to Kai. And then <laughs> Alexis can either decide to bring it down or up. Oh my God. I have, mm, I can't even tell you. Anyways, we're going from New Mexico to where yeah, Kai, are we, uh, where are we going? We are going. Today's paranormal case takes us yes. to Adams, Tennessee. Whoa, where, Tennessee. Whoa. Tennessee, yeah. Where actually the most, it's said to be, it's the most infamous and well-documented haunting in American history Whoa. did occur. Yeah. Wait. Which is kind okay. of ironic because I had never heard about it until <laughs> I chose it and started doing research on it. <laughs> but I feel like because it's well-documented, well, well documented, you're going to have a lot of info for us. Yes, okay. yes. Um, well documented in, in, I guess, two, two types of context, as in there's lots of documents back from when it happened, which is over 200 years ago now. Um, what? yeah, so lots of like documentation from back then, but also lots of coverage like now in our modern times. Um, okay. But yeah. So I'll be talking about the bell, Witch haunting. And I knew it. the torments of the Bell family from um, 1817 to 1821. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I've heard of it. It sounds familiar, but. Okay. I definitely so... don't know as much as you do right now. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Perfect. That's the <laughs> point. <laughs> um, okay. Well, firstly, I do want to talk about the Bell family themselves because this is who it kind of set the story centers around. Um, mm -hmm. But specifically, a lot of the story does center around John Bell. He was the father of the Bell family. Um, so he was born in Halifax County, North Carolina in 1750. Um, his parents are William Bell and Ann Jones. Um, so he's from North Carolina. Uh, so not originally from Tennessee. Um, hmm. In 1782, uh, John would marry Lucy Williams from Edgecombe County, North Carolina. So different counties, but uh, still both from North Carolina. Um, <laughs> um, her father was John Williams. He was a he was a respected farmer out in Edgecombe County. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel um, like being called a respected farmer no, back in the day was like was a huge compliment. It, yeah. I was also going to say that, but also <laughs> it was 1782. What else was yeah. there to do besides farm? 
<laughs> Fair. <laughs> yeah. Fish, maybe? <laughs> you were either a farmer or a fisherman. But I also don't the think sport. I've ever heard anyone being called on... Um, on what's the opposite of respected a disrespected like a farmer disrespected a hated farmer <laughs> yeah like i don't think i've ever heard someone being called that <laughs> that's me um <laughs> yeah. yeah so john and lucy they bought a farm in edgecombe county um and they began to make themselves known you know they they gathered wealth and respect um, throughout the community they were dedicated reliable farmers as well um, they sound so cute John and Lucy, um, they sound cute until you realize that it's like the 1700s when like everyone owned slaves. Oh yeah, you're so things. right. Uh, mm. Yeah. So <laughs> John and Lucy I brought that up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was gonna be like Alexis. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh. All right. So John and Lucy, they would eventually have nine children. Uh, Jesse, John Jr., Drury, Benjamin, Esther, Zadok, Betsy, Richard, and Joel. Um, so they had nine names. children. Okay. Um, yes? No, no, no. I was just counting in my fingers and I count at eight, but there's nine. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, I believe this is it, but like I couldn't find anything quite confirmed yet. Um, I do believe the first six of their children they had uh, were born in North Carolina, but then their last three children were born um, in Tennessee after they moved. Uh, mm -hmm. Not quite. Okay. Before. But yeah, in 1804 is when the Bell family would uproot and they'd start a farm on uh, lots of acres of land on the Red River in Robertson County, Tennessee. So they moved from North Carolina to Tennessee um, to purchase uh, lots of acres of land, close to, I believe, 400 acres of land. Um, Do sort you know of how much they purchased it for? No, I'm honestly not sure, but I imagine a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> they probably had their farmers. Um, yeah. yeah. So the their children, they would eventually grow up begin to live their own lives, um, which I can get into in a little bit. Uh, but for now, let's let's talk about the hauntings. So the first sightings of the Bell Witch began in 1817. So 13 years after the Bell family had actually moved to Tennessee and moved to the farm. Um, mm -hmm. so, Spooky. 13 years after? Yeah. Oh, 13. <laughs> um no, so like they 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 you know built a relatively fine life there, and and their yeah. kids who were who were born in Tennessee, they were kind of grown up already, um, starting to live their lives. Uh, but yeah, so it was one day when John Bell, the father, he was out in his cornfield, um, just checking out his crops, and that's when he spotted a very strange looking animal. Um, it was described as having the body of a dog and the head of a rabbit. I'm trying to picture it <laughs> in my head. Okay. And uh, does it look right? <laughs> hold on. I know it's a stupid question, but <laughs> was it like the body of a dog and then a tiny rabbit head size? <laughs> or was it like a dog sized rabbit head? I'm not sure. There's, there's, that's one of the, actually the least documented things about it. Um, about oh. what exactly, what exactly like the dog looked like. Um, but I don't know. I still find it really funny. Such a well documented yeah. case, except for what the creature that was spotted is. Exactly. Well, because it, it's all based on interpretation on like the, their, their drawings and things like that afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So body of a dog, head of a rabbit. Um, Bell fired at the animal with his rifle, but instead of like it being hit, it simply just vanished, just like what? out of thin air. Yeah, like, like not into like sand or dust, just like no, it just wrong. disappeared. Like that's that's what it documented. It simply hallucinations with no trace. They were on drugs. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, they were. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bell moved on he didn't think much about what had happened even though an animal 
vanished in front of his eyes. Yeah. He didn't think much of what had happened until later that night. And that's when things really started to begin. Um, the Bell family began to hear like something beating on the outside of their log home, like trying to get in, um, something beating on the outside. Uh, the, the sounds kept getting more and more intense and forceful every night. Uh, but every time Bell and his sons ran outside to catch the culprit, there was, of course, nothing there um, that they could ever find. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these oh. sounds eventually make their way inside the home um, with reports of the children waking up in the middle of the night to the sound of rats gnawing at their bedposts. Um, I know exactly what that sounds like. <laughs> I never what? will hear that. We are All right. Um invisible uh, dogs fighting inside the house outside um and even like chains dragging on the floor uh, okay it, this escalated quickly yes yeah um it's also been kind of documented that apparently they heard like the sounds of choking and strangling as mm -hmm. well um heavy objects hitting the floor um sounds coming from the bedrooms as if the beds were being ripped apart um but Nothing to actually cause any of this noise was ever found inside of the house. And at this point, this started reminding me of Jeff the Talking Mongoose. I was going to bring that up. <laughs> I wanted to bring it up from the moment, the very first moment you said they went vanished. <laughs> yeah. No, like getting inside their house and like chains uh, rattling. Doing all these things. Yeah. I will hold like, you with chains rattling. <laughs> exactly. Like you can imagine how terrified how frightened the children were especially when their bed sheets started flying off in the middle of the night oh, um no if that know, happens i'm out yeah uh, um, and not only that, like their hair was getting pulled they were scratched randomly um, by like an invisible entity um again nothing was really ever found um so like i mentioned earlier the bell family did have slaves <laughs> um mm -hmm. unfortunately and one of their slaves, uh, a man named Dean, had reported that he was being followed by a large black dog or wolf-like creature um, when he would walk home at night to go visit his wife. And this dog was described as sometimes having two heads or no head at all. That's uh, a big difference. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure if it's... Um, like either or, or if both would happen. Um, I imagine maybe it was both. Like sometimes it would just have two heads or sometimes it would have no head at all. Um, I feel like that's more concerning than a dog with two heads. I feel like a dog with two heads is like, it's natural. Like it's not, it's not common. Uh -huh. It's not common, but like it happens in animals. Yeah. Like animals yeah. have two heads sometimes. But I yeah, what I'm trying to imagine what? is that you see a dog with, like, no head, and then, like, the week later, you see the same dog, but it has now two heads. Yeah, no, that's... And then, like, you yeah. might see it again without a head. I think that's more concerning, if it keeps, like, okay. switching back and forth. But also, now that I'm thinking about it, if it was the early 1800s and I saw a dog with two heads, I would think that's witchcraft. Not oh, yeah, it's so true. Did right? did someone right? get burned? Um, they tried eventually. I'll get into that a little bit later on. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, okay, I'm gonna keep yeah. let you go. No, 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 what? good question, good question, good question. Um, so Dean the slave, he eventually had even claimed that he was turned into a mule and attacked by what? the witch. And there's actually uh. like a, uh, there's like drawings of like Dean confronting the witch or Dean being turned into a mule, like, um, like, yeah, no. like little drawings depicting it sort of, um, they're kind of interesting to look at, but was it like he was, I don't know if you know, but like, was he turned into a mule multiple times or just one time? Um, I think just one time. Um, but he was attacked several times by the witch. Um, he said, like, he encountered the witch several times, um, 
and would follow him a lot. Apparently, he after that, Dean at all times like carried an axe and a witch ball that his wife yeah, made him as a, as protection from the witch. What's a witch ball? I have no clue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, just uh, some sort of protection from a witch. But I'm looking at it. Fair. I was looking gonna be like, because yeah. I want one. Honestly, same. Mm-hmm. It's a hollow sphere of plain or striated glass hung in co- cottage windows in the 18th century to ward off evil spirits, but later oh, often okay. posed on top of a vase. Question. Wow. Do I need a cottage for them? <laughs> yes. I honestly yeah. didn't look it up because I just I I assumed it was like something that the wife made specifically rather than yeah. like yeah. a rather than like, like an actual made, uh... thing that was kind of known back then. No, fair, yeah. fair. I mean, that's why I was curious. I was like, do we know what it was? Apparently it was a I common just thing. For the hell of okay. It. Cool. So, yeah, like different encounters and stories like this um but honestly, this is all pretty tame um, to what would happen after this. Um, people the witch... are getting scratched. People are getting turned into a mule. And you tell me this is tame? Yeah, like at least in terms of of, of violence, I guess. Oh. Um, yeah. The, the witch slowly began to manifest itself. Um, the family started to hear faint whispers that sometimes sounded like an old woman woman singing hymns in the house. Um, and the encounters with the children, especially Betsy, got much, much more violent. Um, Betsy would be the target of most of the witch's torment over those couple of years. Um, she, Betsy you know was the... Y- she was the youngest daughter, um, and so I do believe she was um, – their ages aren't actually quite documented, um, but she was probably anywhere from, like, 13 to 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 16, somewhere like that. Um, okay. I'd, I'd kind of imagine her as, like, 13 or 14. No, fair. And she was the youngest out of nine, right? She was the youngest daughter, yeah, and there was two – there were two boys after her, but uh, they came very soon after. So they're all around the same age. Okay. Um, yeah. So Betsy was the target uh, of most of the witches, you know, violence and things like that. She just seemed to sort of hate her. Um, the witch did. Uh, Poor Betsy, Betsy would be. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure Betsy hated the witch too. <laughs> oh yeah. No, they, they definitely, it was a mutual hatred going on there. Um, Betsy would be brutally slapped, beaten, um, her hair would be violently pulled, even dragged a bit, and like very, very often there would be so many welts and bruises and um, found on her face, on her body, and it was all from this invisible entity that they, they couldn't figure out what it was yet. Poor Betsy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Things got bad like could you imagine doing that i'm surprised she didn't try to run or something like that uh, yeah. They, yeah no yeah i mean where would she run it was like the 1800s exactly there was there was no where she really could have gone um but it's actually she sort of did try to leave um she she tried to escape a bit um, she sometimes would be sent over to, or her parents would send Betsy over to like a neighbor's house to rest sometimes. It said that it was documented. Um, and, um, she says, or like a, a description from Betsy after an incident actually does say, um, quote, like my first night away from home was spent, um, with Thenny Thorne. Uh, they, so she did go away. Um, they slept for the night, and apparently there was like a loud knocking outside of the door. The door flew open. There was a big gust of wind. Um, but then when they sprung up from the bed, the door wasn't open. Um, but then they heard a, or Betsy heard a soft voice. It said, 
quote, Betsy, you should not have come here. You know I can follow you anywhere. Now get a good night's sleep. End quote. What? Oh yeah. my god. No. Was yeah. Betsy the only one that heard this? Um, so Betsy heard this voice specifically, yes. Um it's, it's not said that the other person you. heard it, but there have been people who heard other things from the witch too. Uh, no, I'm. Bet, what do you yeah. want? Leave me alone. Betsy said that a soft hand patted her cheek, and then the voice again assured her that she would be okay for the night. <laughs> yeah. For the night. <laughs> for the night. Okay, so mm -hmm. you're should a bad witch. Uh, because yeah. it sounds like something was trying to take care of her or, like, make her feel better. No, and ah. that's, the th that's the thing. It's, like, they, it's literally said that at times the witch had even, like, displayed sort of bits of kindness, like, to the people in the family. Um, it's, it's documented um, that uh, the... The Bell Witch really liked Lucy, uh, John Bell's wife, so the mom of the family. Um, oh. It, it said that the witch said, uh, quote, or called Lucy, quote, the most perfect woman to walk the earth. Oh, my gosh. That's so okay. sweet, though. Is it? <laughs> my children are getting harassed, and I'm getting called the most perfect woman in the world? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> what are you trying to? If I'm the most perfect woman in the world, are you telling me I got the most not perfect children? I I guess so. I don't know. <laughs> um, apparently the witch like would give Lucy like fresh fruit and sing to her. Um, what? And also later on, um, like a, later on in the years, um, John John Junior. and the witch would have like deep conversations with each other Whoa. uh yeah. this is not a pet you should not be <laughs> talking to them just casually. this is jeff the mongoose but unhinged <laughs> jeff the mongoose if he actually followed through with his threats <laughs> yeah <laughs> kill the poultry literally. yeah <laughs> i will find you wherever you go literally <laughs> Yeah. No, so so I did jump ahead a little bit saying some of that, but like it just it dude, no, it's it's actually kind of crazy that this witch is like all over the place. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it's like the witch just kind of grew accustomed to them and kind of gave up torturing them. Uh not quite. Um so Things got so bad that uh. um, things got so bad that John, the the father, he like broke his vow to keep it secret, and he let his neighbor and his close friend uh, James Johnston know about what was happening to the family. Of course, Johnston and his wife were very skeptical about it, so they stayed the night. One night, um, what? it was relatively oh. okay. It was relatively okay at the start, but. Once they went to sleep that night, of course, their sheets were yanked off of their bed. Um, and But then Johnston, he jumped out of bed and yelled, In the name of the Lord, who are you and what do you want? Yes! <laughs> Did he get a the, response? The witch didn't respond. Oh. But, but it was said that the rest of the night was peaceful. So oh. the witch did not do anything else after that. Not sure why. Um, but then the next I'm day, so yeah, she got the witch got scared. <laughs> she it sounds like, like it. She was like, "Okay, I'm gonna. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, I'll take a little break." <laughs> could you so, imagine if it was like you rip the sheets off? He says that line, and then the witch is just like, "Okay, we got a crazy one in here. I'm gonna go away." <laughs> Yeah, she's like, uh, you mentioned the Lord. I'm gonna... <laughs> no, <it's laughs> yeah. yeah, he yeah. wouldn't like what I'm doing right now. Like... <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't like you using his name in vain. Exactly. <laughs> I'll let him take care of you tonight, not me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but yeah, the, ne- the next day, Johnston like talked with the Bell family, and he said, "quote It was likely an evil spirit, the kind that the Bible talks about." Oh, oh my god! <laughs> so that's what Johnston believed about this, um, and like this. It definitely is not where it ended, not for the witch and not for the exposure that this family would get from it as well. Um, More time went on, but the witch gets stronger. She's able to manifest herself more, her voice, her presence. Uh, The witch more fully sings hymns. Uh, She is heard quoting scriptures. She held conversations, like I mentioned. Um, She even managed to quote two different sermons that were preached by reverends on the same day at the same time miles apart which implies that the witch could be in multiple places at once i don't like that yeah multiple places in once it's even documented that like she even had like super speed superhuman speed and she can move quickly no this is going to a different different level (laughs) Yeah, no, this uh, witch is, like, insane. Uh, uh-uh. Alexis, were you going to say something, or? Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> no. I'm just going to shut up. I don't want her to hear me. All right. <laughs> no, fair, fair. <laughs> um, yeah, so there was it's even said that the witch like gossiped about other households and she'd like this leave. is jeff as a witch <laughs> this is jeff as a witch <laughs> she'd like leave and then she'd come back in a bit to like to visit a home or something like that and she brings um, the gossip yeah yeah um, I, it, it's crazy it's actually crazy i want to um, hate her but kind of hold like- on I'm sure you're going to tell us, but is there a name to this witch? Um, sort of. There's been documents that her name could have been Kate. Um, mm-hmm. So at one point, um, there's a there's an author. His name is M.V. Ingram. Um, he wrote what's called An Authenticated History of the Famous Bell Witch. Um, it was in 1894. And so this is the first full length like recording of the Bell Witch hauntings. Okay. um, 1894. (laughs) And that's that's, like, that's so long ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And that's why, like, it is a full on book. And that's where a lot of this information is being drawn from. I'm glad Um, that like someone wrote it down. Yes. So he actually said that, um, in his published book, uh, Ingram says that the ghost, the witch's name was Kate after, um, like the entity, like it claimed to be old Kate Bat's witch. Um, and so Kate was like a, um, I, I, I forget exactly, but, uh, Kate was definitely involved, like in the community. Um, it was said that uh, at one point, maybe Kate and John Bell, uh, the father, had sort of a, a disagreement about um, about some purchase for land, and something you know bad could have happened to that. There could have been bad blood there, and that's why this mm-hmm. spirit of Kate came back to haunt the family. Um, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. So there's. That's not confirmed. And and the thing is, with how much documentation there is about this case, there's so many different viewpoints and perspectives of it as well. Um, but it's not yeah. necessarily it's not necessarily like widely accepted that the witch is the spirit of Kate, but sometimes she is known as Kate. OK, no, that's. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can't yeah. argue with that because. It's been like 200 years. Yeah. So, okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? There's not much yeah. you can really do about it. You know, sometimes she identifies as Kate. Yeah. Other times she doesn't. Um, it's because like over the years, there's, there's been the, you know, the 
authenticated history that um, Martin Ingram wrote, but there's been other writings that have came after that as well. Um, and they all have different sort of interpretations here and there. Um, yeah. But yeah, so like I did mention, um, Betsy was really the most abused by the witch. Um, yeah. And for like unknown reasons, apparently the witch really hated uh, Betsy's childhood sweetheart. His name was Joshua Gardner. Um, oh, Betsy, I'm sorry. If you're yeah. not going to let Betsy date, go find her a man then. <laughs> right. <laughs> if he's not good enough for Betsy, who is? No, for real. So yeah, they were they were childhood sweethearts. They loved each other. They were wanting to, you know, be married. Um, but uh the witch would, you know, taunt her, would abuse Betsy um to to stop her from marrying Joshua. Um but so they did they did stay together for a bit, but eventually um you know, like they, they kept putting off the marriage because they were scared oh, the of the witch. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, the like the witch was just attacking her so so much that Betsy uh, began to have you know fainting smells or spells. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> no. um, <Yeah>. smells. <laughs> yeah, yeah, eighteen um, hundreds. It was fainting exactly smells. fainting smells. Yeah. <laughs> Fainting smell or spells. <laughs> um, <laughs> leave me alone. Um, fainting Carry spells. Uh, Betsy would be like tired and exhausted and, and even looking lifeless sometimes. And yeah, you're being tormented by a spirit. I, <laughs> I don't blame you. Yeah. Um, I mean, he did stick around for a while and then it got too much to be too much for him. Yeah. So I don't blame him. Yeah. So they stayed together for a bit, Betsy and Joshua. Um, but eventually Betsy couldn't take it anymore. She, uh, she broke it off with Joshua. And that's when the, the witch kind of started to leave her alone a bit more. Um, not quite as much. Oh, yeah. Give her a broken heart. Yep. <laughs> broken heart but i guess not for long because uh betsy eventually married her former teacher oh, i'm sorry richard Powell. Uh, yeah uh, <laughs> yeah so um, apparently he richard was actually um joshua and betsy's like former teacher back when uh, mm. they were school kids um he he was like 11 years older than her or something like that no 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 um, and he said that he had it was just uh documented that like he had a fondness for her even while she was with joshua um he, oh, he, he was waited very, for the breakup yeah. he waited for the breakup he was oh, very disappointed no. disappointed with her like you know her union with joshua um <laughs> yeah but eventually um in 1820, Betsy and um, Richard like left the area and they settled in Mississippi, and so that's why the the spirit started to leave leave her alone a bit more. I don't um, like that though. Yeah. After this, though, Betsy was not quite the focus of the witch anymore. Um, sure. It's. It turned to John, the father. Um, oh, one of the central, like one of one of the goals of the Bell Witch throughout the entire course of these years was wanting the death of John, John Senior, the father. So, um, the witch hated him for some reason. Uh, she called him Old Jack Bell, um, and she constantly. Um, you know, put curses on him, threatened him, uh, you know, abused him physically, just like Betsy as well. Um, throughout the years, it just got worse and worse. And uh, the witch really intended on on killing him. And eventually, she would. So, 
John Sr. is actually, his death is the only death in American history to be attributed to the paranormal. Oh, wow. No. Wait, yeah. what? Yeah. So the, the Tennessee government recognized his death um, as paranormal. They, it's one of the only investigations that, like paranormal investigations that was done by a government. Um, they, the, the Tennessee government, they actually take this very seriously. What did they do though? Um, they, not much. There wasn't really anything I... for them to do. You know, there was a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, of knowledge, a lot of intrigue about what had happened. Um, even extending out to the likes of like Andrew Jackson. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm sorry. Yeah. Andrew Jackson took a great interest in the bell, Witch. Yeah. so it said that, um, you know, he was the, he was the major, the general major back during that time. He was to be future president. Um, but apparently Jackson, he owned property on the red river as well. So, you know, not far off. And, and he heard of the hauntings of the bell, Witch. So he he proceeded to go over there one day um, with um, a few of his men, uh, some horses, and those horses were drawing a wagon. But on their way to the the bell farm, their wagon suddenly got stuck and it couldn't be moved. Um, they like you know, they examined it, they tried to get it out, but that wagon just would not move. Almost like it, there was unseen forces that were stopping it from doing so. Damn. Um, and so Andrew Jackson, it, it's documented that he exclaimed, "By the eternal, boys, this is the witch." <laughs> <laughs> and, apparently, so excited. and apparently, the witch replied and said, "All right, General, let the wagon move on. I will see you again tonight." And oh. the wagon started to move again. <laughs> oh my god yeah this witch is talkative i don't know i kind of like her no literally yeah that, that's, <laughs> what <I'm, laughs> that's what i'm saying this is man and her 20 dollar bill <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah. just, I'm just trying to process this man yelling <laughs> out into like it was just a silly guy. By the oh, eternal okay. boys, this is the <laughs> witch. <laughs> and then she just shows up. Sure. <clears throat> cool. I'll take it. Not yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so later that evening they like sort of they basically made their way over to the Bell Farm and they camped out that night, uh, Jackson and his men. Um one of his men essentially was like a he proclaimed himself as a witch hunter. And he said he had a silver <laughs> bullet in his gun. Um, uh -huh. And that silver bullet is the reason why the witch wasn't showing up. She was scared. Wait, um, what? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, Jackson, like, whispered to one of his other men and said, I'll bet this fellow is an errant coward. By the Eternals, <laughs> I do wish the thing would come. I want to see him run. And... Uh -oh. After that, after a brief moment of silence, uh, footsteps started to be heard, uh, light, light footsteps on the floor, and a disembodied voice said, All right, General, I am on hand and ready for business. Oh my <laughs> god. Okay, it's, it seems <laughs> like it's full right enough to, to be a like showdown. It. it almost was. Um the the bell witch apparently like taunted the hunter and told him to shoot her but uh but apparently it said that that hunter he was you know like kicked <laughs> like kicked in the butt essentially probably <laughs> by the, an unseen force um he exclaimed that he felt the pain of being stuck by needles all throughout uh -huh. his body um and he was like kicked out of the tent and he he just fled he ran um and that was the witch is doing apparently um, apparently the witch did say <laughs> apparently the witch said how the devil did run and beg i'll bet he won't come through here again with his old horse pistol to shoot me 
I guess that's fun enough for tonight, General, and you can go to bed now. I will come tomorrow night and show you another rascal in this crowd. Oh my god. This, this witch. I kinda I, love her. Um I am so intrigued by her. <laughs> she's a character. It's like the only way I yeah, yeah, she she's is. a character. She's a so Jackson awesome. and his men, they got scared and they ran away and went back to Nashville. <laughs> where I, Jackson I, Yeah. I know I'm not supposed to like her because she's abusing people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But it's but it's hard not to kind of like her sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um anyway, that was a bit of a tangent. Uh because I because <laughs> I was <laughs> we were making our way towards John, John Sr. and his death. Um, yeah, yeah. So, like I said, that that's one of the most like interesting parts about the story to me is that, like, the Tennessee government, like, this is the only yeah. death that is actually attributed to a paranormal source, and yeah. I think that's crazy. Um, the story goes is that, um. After everything had happened to John, he was in his old age, old age, you know, old Jack Bell, as the witch called him, um, old age. He was also being tormented by that witch. And of course, um, he just couldn't really carry on. Uh, Bell, he, he got sick and he basically was, uh, like bedridden. Um, he was cared for by John Jr., his son. Um, so, on December 19th, it said, the night of December 19th, um, John, um, you know, of course, didn't get up to bed. So his son, John Jr., went to retrieve some medicine for him. Um, but in the cupboard, instead of finding the regular medicine vials, he only found one vial. And it was full of a dark, like, smoky black liquid. Um that he just like he didn't know what it was. Um, That's the voice, interesting, though. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the voice, the voice of the witch appeared and said, "It's loose, useless for you to try to relieve old Jack. I have got him this time. He will never get up from that bed again." She oh. said she gave old Jack a big dose of it last night while he was fast asleep, which fixed him. No. John Jr. Then, John Jr. then did pass away the next day on December twentieth, eighteen twenty. How old was he? Um, he was born. <sighs> Math time. He was born seventeen fifty. Died eighteen twenty. So seventy. Seventy years. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Still, I mean. Uh... Yeah. Be killed by a witch. That's right? that's a story. It's, it's obviously still pretty young, too, in my yeah. opinion. So it's said that um, John Jr. he like threw the vial into the fire and it erupted into like a huge blue blaze. So whoa, um, yeah. <laughs> See, um, this is all before like movies. So yeah, <laughs> I, I kind of like how like they were so descriptive of things that happened. Yeah, but it also begs the question of, like, are they so descriptive because they're making it up, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, true. I don't know. But, yeah, um, John Sr.'s funeral was actually huge. People all over, you know, heard of his passing. They had known of the Bell Witch hauntings. So that was a huge funeral service for him. And apparently, of course, the witch disrupted, like, the funeral also. Oh, my God, um, no! Leave the like poor man alone. And things. Yeah. <laughs> he was a yeah. respected farmer. Can you not respect him? He literally he was. was. He was. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. If some witch comes to bother my funeral, I'm getting up and fighting her. What exactly did she do? If you don't mind me asking. What? If you know. What did, what did, did she, she do? At the funeral? Yeah. yeah. I think she was just acting like a like a drunk person and singing like drinking songs is what Oh it says. my god. Oh, this girl is witch. <laughs> but but yeah. Um so I wonder if she knows Jeff. 
She probably created Jeff. She probably does. Jeff was her pet. Uh, <laughs> oh my god. Honestly, yeah. Jeff was conjured by the, the Bell Witch. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it's just wild. This poor man didn't even get respect once he was dead. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of crazy. Um, so... I do, like, I yeah, I jumped kind of forward earlier talking about Kate a bit, but um, I will talk about, like, the actual Kate a little bit now. Um, so a lady named Mary Catherine Kate Batts. Um, so she was, like, the wife of Frederick Batts, who uh, people s- sort of kind of thought that he could have been the culprit behind a lot of, like, the disturbances of the Bell Witch. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Kate, she was kind of like seen around the the Red River like settlement community. Um, people thought she was like practicing black magic or was involved in other forms of the occult because um, she was just kind of strange and she had words used improperly, things like that. Because um, she was a medicine woman. <laughs> no, <laughs> literally. <laughs> But yeah, like uh-huh. I mentioned, there was there was sort of a dispute between um, Benjamin Batts, Kate's uh, Kate's older brother, and John Senior, and so it was actually over the the sale of a slave, not um, property. Oh. I guess a slave was property back then. Oh. Um, oh. So yeah, they the dispute uh, just kind of turned a little nasty, and it said that. Um, Maybe the Bell Witch was created by Kate to kind of get revenge on the Bell family. Um, yeah, it, it's not very clear. Like, it is sort of just writings. It, it's not sure how true that actually is. If, you know, Kate was alive and she was culprit behind the hauntings or if the bell witch herself was just the spirit of kate um again not too sure so i didn't really include that too much no that's fine i mean i would imagine over 200 years there's a lot of information to go through there really is Mm -hmm. um so after john senior died though that was not where it ended (laughs) um that's right. There's still more yeah. family members to torture. Exactly. So uh. Bell died December 20th, 1820. Um, but the hauntings lasted honestly through April of 1821, the next year. Well, um, <clears throat> that's sort of when Betsy had, you know, finally broken off the engagement. She moved away with um, <laughs> with her former teacher. Uh, <laughs> that's a whole story on its own. Yeah. And so apparently the witch had visited um, Lucy, the the, oh, the, mom. the mom, the mom that she loved. And she told Lucy that um, the witch told Lucy that she would be leaving, but she would return in seven years. So in 1828. Oh. And true yeah. to form, the witch showed back up in 1828. She's um, a woman of a word. Yeah. Um you know how I mentioned earlier how, like, uh, John Jr. and the witch would have conversations? Oh, yeah. This is sort of what it would happen in 1828. Um, oh. Apparently, they had, like, deep philosophical conversations about, like, the origin of, like, religion, uh, life, civilization, uh, things like that. Um <laughs> Apparently, the Bell Witch even predicted, like, the Civil War and other events. Um, what? Yeah. <clears throat> but after that, the Bell Witch left just a few weeks later, um, but did promise to visit John Bell's most direct descendant in exactly 107 years. Wait, so, okay. Yes. So can you take us now to 107 years from this? (laughs) Yes, I can. (laughs) Um, 107 years later. Yeah. I was going to be like, how do you pass that knowledge onto your like descendants? I know it's crazy. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like it would become like a legend. Like, oh yeah, according to your grandpa, like in 30 years, your children are going to be visited by a (laughs) a witch. witch. (laughs) No, that's kind of what happened. It's 
so okay, 107 years later would be 1935. Um, 1935, the closest direct descendant was a, a doctor. Um, his name was Dr. Charles Bailey Bell. Um, he was a neurologist, and he was um, John Senior's great grandson. So he was already great. Like 107 oh. years had passed. It was his great grandson. Yeah. Um, in 1934, uh, Doctor Bell, the the living descendant, he published a book about the Bell Witch, um, and so it brought more awareness to like the impen to the return of the witch. Um, and this is also another reason why it's one of the like most documented cases because the uh, the book apparently contained like um, the first accounts of the conversations that John Jr. and the witch would have in 1828. So when they had those deep conversations uh, together, that's what these accounts held in that book. Um, <laughs> And so there was there was notes that were taken, and they were just being passed down generation by generation to keep in the family. I like that, wow. but at the same time, it's like your first victim was like a farmer, and now you're going to like a man of science. Yeah, uh, this witch is all over the place. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I mean, it's not like she had to pick. His That's true. She could career. be what she wanted. I mean, yeah. she just shows up and it's like, oh, you're a doctor. Yeah. So 1934, that was published. 1935 comes around. There's really no sighting of the witch. Um, some people don't know if she returned or maybe she even never left in the first place. But there really was no sign of the witch that happened um, in 1935. Wow. And so that's basically when it kind of ended. Um, at least for no. the family. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I kind of this... wanted her return. <laughs> well, maybe she's still here. Maybe. The, um, there actually is the Bell Witch Cave, cave. which is yeah. currently still in operation. And you can still take tours there. Um, it's... It's the original cave that the Bell family would have like gone into as well. It's mostly unchanged. Um, the actual like house and land itself is kind of different. The, 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 the house was torn down afterwards, so it doesn't exist anymore. But yeah, the Bell Witch mm -hmm. Cave does still exist um, pretty much in its original state. But it's made to be like a little bit more, I guess, museum-y in a way. Yeah. I was going to ask, do you know, do we know why farmers would go into a cave? Um, apparently they used it for like storage. Like oh, okay. they used it for like that old storage sense. and stuff because it stayed naturally cool. Um, that... Smart. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm yeah, okay you can still, I was just take, curious. You can still take tours of the cave today. There's guides and things. Um, and people have, you know, reported that, they they've they've reported things like you know whispers people talking um lights like dancing through apparently taking pictures is very hard in the cave um they don't come out well or there's mist orbs of lights other things like that um the the cave was never directly tied to any of the hauntings but it's still on the property and it's still there so you know who knows it could still be part of it Okay, so do we know if do you know if the doctor descendant lived yeah. near, like if he lived in the same state or like in the same county as the farm? Yes. Um. So he lived in he lived in Nashville. He was a Nashville physician, so he was still in Tennessee. Um. But I do believe. Let me see how far Nashville is from like Adams. Yeah, because I was just wondering. I was like, maybe it wasn't it's close a, enough. Forty-five for minute drive. Oh, I think that's close enough. She no, has it's definitely speed anyway. Enough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she could easily go there. Um, so yeah, he was not far. Um, I don't know. the The doctor, Doctor Bell, eventually did pass away in nineteen forty five. So, mm. oh, so whoever the descendants yeah. are, give it. I don't know. Another one hundred and seven years. <laughs> yeah, maybe she'll come back. 
<laughs> Maybe the name is Heard of 107, and it's some other number. Yeah, on it, then, like, she, she came back, but they weren't expecting it, so she was just like, okay, what the fuck? And then she gave sad. me a warning. <laughs> yeah. Fair. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the, the story of the Bell Witch Hauntings. The most famous haunting in American history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I actually on our list of places to travel. Yeah. No, I've been, I was going to say, like, I, I knew about the Bell Witch Cave. I didn't really know much about the hauntings or anything like that. So, like, uh-huh. this was all new information to me. But I knew about the cave. And that was, like, a place I wanted to go to for a while. Hell yeah. Did you, you say go? that you Should... went to? I want, no, no, no. Oh. No, I want <laughs> to go. Okay. I wanted to go there for a while. I don't no, travel I like that. was the opposite. I knew of the case. I didn't know many, actually, I didn't know any details. Like, I knew of the name. That was it. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Course. Thank you guys for listening. Made me yeah. feel better for my case. <laughs> I tried to bring it, bring up the energy a bit, I guess. No, no. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> uh, now we're going to find out what Alexis is going to do with the energy. You guys aren't uh, prepared. Oh, uh, we're not? For a no, laugh we're... or for like depression? Um... <laughs> Whoa. Um actually Either one. <laughs> actually, a little bit of both. But um or, or more of the funny to me at least. Kind of. But um Where are you taking us? We're not we're not we're not in the US anymore. Romania. Okay. Oh no, we're actually not in Romania. We are in Australia. <laughs> yeah, I'm Kai Sick. for today. Sick. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's see it. Let's hear it. We're going to Western Australia. I tried to look up specifically where in Australia it was. All I know is that's in in the Campion. I I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Campion County. Um, But this is a story of the Great Emu War. Let's go! Yeah! Uh, Don't know details, <laughs> but I'm so glad you're doing it. Yes. <laughs> I was like looking yes. up cases for me to do, and I was like, no, I have to do this. Okay. So this happened in Western Australia, 1932. It was a military operation created to address the great emu population. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> emus are mainly found in Australia. There were so many emus and they were damaging literally so much of the crops within Western Australia that there was a whole campaign created to basically start a war against the emus. Um, So it lasted from November 2nd of 1932 until December 10th of 1932. So um, a month, a month, a week, and a day, to be exact. Um, a month, a week, and a day. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> the Royal Australian Artillery kind of uh, organization, kind of, they, they help maximize weapons to like, their full potential and everything. Um, mm-hmm. They have three members attempt to call roughly around 20,000 emus. God damn. 20,000? <laughs> Twenty thousand. No, when I saw that number, I was like, "There's no way. There's that many emus." That's I would plane. love to witness that. <laughs> yeah. Um. So at the Dude, time, how do they even fit there? Like, no, seriously. <laughs> okay. Do you know that scene from The Lion King when, like, yes, Dimba falls down and like is dying. <laughs> Yeah. And then there's a, that's what I picture of the emus, just a stampede yeah. of emus. No, stampede of emus. The, yeah, honestly, that's what happened. This is the Lion nice. King before it came out. Nice. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Who's dying? No, no, no. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, um, local farmers at the time were struggling to keep their crops 
since the emus were like destroying them. So they signed a petition making complaints about the emus. Um, there was a confirmation that after like two months, maybe less, that they had killed a thousand emus. Damn, I'm sorry. So many. How many days yeah. was this? Uh, um, well, for the amount of time that they were trying to kill the emus. Well, I mean, it was I'm just two saying. Months. Okay, two months for a thousand. At that point, well, nineteen thousand yeah. left. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, like, although a thousand is a lot. It actually wasn't a lot compared to the rest of the population they had still. Um, so, but, but overall, this campaign, it caused some embarrassment because they did not succeed very much. Um, so emus have been found within Australia for literally thousands of years. Yeah. Um, as long as they've been living in this country, some still weren't too fond of them, including the government. Uh, the Australian government. I know emus are cute. Um, the they're Australian big. government. They are. Uh, yeah, they're the second largest uh, flightless bird. First largest is ostrich. Anyways, ostrich. Yeah. I and love then we ostriches. got the emus. And then we have the emus. But um, in in Australia, they were their status was under protected native species. Eventually, the government changed it to vermin. Vermin? What the fuck? Yep. This is... Yep. No. The Australian mm-hmm. government are the vermin. Vermin. <laughs> <laughs> so, I did mention this took place in 1932, which had yeah. not only followed World War I, but also the Great Depression. And so that's why these crops were so vital. They literally needed all of this in order to survive. They were specifically growing wheat at the time. They had been growing large amounts of wheat. Um, And whenever the emus would try to get to the crops, they would break break through the farmer's fences, dig holes big enough for other critters to get in. And if they were to try to eat the crops, they would literally destroy everything around it. And so, of course... That screwed them over big time. They needed that. They needed those crops yeah. in order to live, you know? So understandably, they were a little bit upset, but what they did <laughs> is not justified. Um, so there was a drought in Australia of 1932, and that actually caused a large migration in emus. Um, so that also caused more damage to the crops. Some farmers were actually given permission to shoot the emus themselves no yeah but uh, a lot of the farmers at the time had also been veterans and were in a military program that actually led them to be settled on that land which they were helping out farm so Mm -hmm. the farmers had actually had very limited resources they wanted to have shoot the emus on their own but they requested assistance from the government instead. Um, so at the time... Hmm. I imagine it's kind of hard to kill an emu, to be honest. I'm so glad you mentioned I was that. also going to say that the emus fight back. I'm going to... I like those questions. I like those All questions. Right. But I'm going to answer, answer them. them in just a moment. Cool. Uh, <laughs> so, I thought you were going to be like, I'm going to take all questions at the end of a story. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, so at the time, George Purse, he was the minister for defense. He had actually decided to help the veterans feel more at ease. Um, he wanted to kind of let them know that these concerns were being taken seriously. So he dispatched a bunch of professional professional soldiers to help. <laughs> with the problem. Yeah. So at the time, Major... She has a long name, by the way. Gwynedd Purves Wynne Aubrey Meredith. <laughs> she was the major in command, in command. And then Sergeant S. McMurray. And then Gunner J. O. Halloran, the three members of the Royal Australian Artillery, in November 1932, uh, went to travel to where these emus were, which was in the Campion District, to address the issues. So... The group 
the group actually had a cinematographer with them too, which is kind of funny. Um, and had two Lewis automatic machine guns with 10,000 rounds of ammunition. They no. really wanted Damn. to kill them. Yeah, they really oh, wanted to kill these emus. God. I understand that they're like treating them like a vermin, but is there no other way? <laughs> yeah. Um, so they had officially made like three different teams on November 2nd to rally against around 50 emus, which of course it scared the emus, you know, yeah. or like <laughs> they basically just were running for their lives, which actually made it harder <laughs> for them to shoot them. So that was a big fail. The soldiers yeah, they're not going to stand had... still. No, literally, yeah. Oh, literally. <laughs> <laughs> soldiers had planned an ambush on the emus on November 4th, and they began to fire once they noticed that thousands of emus were in their range. Yeah. But one of the guns had jammed after a few rounds, which, of course, gave the emus opportunity to escape. <laughs> um, they tried so many different ways to kill these emus, and they all failed. They attempted Have they to tried a peaceful negotiation? <laughs> <laughs> That's With the emus? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they did try to kill the herds of emus by using trucks with a gunner inside to shoot No them. way. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No way. As horrible as this is, I would love to see that just truck <laughs> driving towards the emus. Okay, is it but just so is it just me or is this giving the same energy as whales? As blowing up whales. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like, it, this, it, it is, it is, it is. That's why I chose it. <laughs> no, like, yes. I've, I've known about the Great Emu War for, like, forever, but I've never known uh -huh. the details of it. Like, I what? haven't known the details either. <laughs> what? They brought up a whole fucking, I literally like, never day. heard of it. <laughs> Dude, it's insane. I was so literally doing funny. research, and I was like, no, this is too... Uh, crazy i need to like i was gonna take a break but i needed to continue don't you just um, love humanity <laughs> love love humans yep yeah yeah the greatest creature ever mm -hmm. I just can you imagine if like <laughs> aliens come down and like they ask us about the great emu war and they're like how do you explain it to them i got him um you got it yeah 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 <laughs> My dad, he goes outside every night to see if there's aliens in this game. Oh, actually... if there's the emus. <laughs> yeah, he does. He does. He does. No, he literally I just goes and, and, and yeah, that too. What? <laughs> <laughs> but he he'll come back inside and he'll be like, "You guys, I saw a saucer right now in the sky. It was crazy. Like I saw <laughs> the, the the lights and everything." <laughs> He uses the like, smoke yeah, as a crazy. and as like as an excuse to go search for the aliens. It's a smoke signal, for, <laughs> you know, smoke signal for the aliens. Bruh. Anyway, aliens are out there. Anyway, we're gonna go back on track onto emus. Um, yeah. so you know they they tried using trucks with a gunner inside to shoot them. Um, that didn't work because the the emus were so much faster than them because they were on a rough terrain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like <laughs> that didn't work. Um and also another thing that made it difficult, I'm so glad you guys asked. It's kind of hard to kill emus because they're hide. It's really tough. So yeah. even if a bullet grazes it, it's not gonna cause any injury to it at least not but, but also like they're a big animal yes like, they're huge and they're bullet, fat. one also, bullet unless like properly placed into like their heart or like yeah. a lung like it's not going to kill it so yeah i don't know if you know about what how was what was the cleanup oh of the corpses oh 
Great I don't question. know. That's a good Great question. question. <laughs> that is such a good question. They <laughs> ate the meat. I don't know. Yes, they did. <laughs> they blew them up. <laughs> We're not doing this. <laughs> But, no, uh, moving away from whales. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, their their hide literally makes it really hard for them to even kill them with like bullets, you know. Um, but three days into the operation, 30 emus had been killed. Um, and then the news at the time had widely publicized on November 8th that <laughs> the emu war had failed. Some tried to make light of the situation, like members of the Australian House of Representatives, by jokingly saying that if anyone deserved medals from this conflict, it would be the emus who'd, quote, won every round so far, end quote. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and it's kind of funny. Uh, but that same day, uh, I did mention Meredith. The well, the major Gwynedd pervs when Aubrey Meredith, we're just going to call her Meredith. Um, she, as well as the soldiers, had withdrawn from the campaign. And while they withdrew, the local farmers had demanded that they return. Of course. Or, they have yeah. Found. Yeah. Four days later, on November 12th, Hearst had decided to redeploy machine gunners for the program after seeing a report of 300 emus being killed. Um, and between November 12th and December 10th, Meredith had reported 986 emus had been killed and another 2,500 had died from their own injuries. Um, still, the numbers weren't enough to continue. So they had noticed a, a pattern and they decided to stop. They also noticed that <laughs> um, one of the emus would be a lookout for the rest of the herd. <laughs> that got so cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they would like basically warn them. And so that would give them an opportunity to run too. So that's why they weren't <laughs> able to kill as many emus as well, because someone was always looking out for them. <laughs> um <laughs> These emus were so tough that Meredith had publicly stated that they could, quote, face machine guns with the invul vulnerability of tanks. End quote. <laughs> Let's go, dude. I love you. <laughs> emus are emus were meant for war. Yes. No, literally. They're invincible. So um, the statements that were made during this time about the war had increasingly made the military act against the emus widely unpopular. <laughs> Which, yeah, uh, should have been like that. So, <laughs> despite everything the emus had gone through, at the end of this war, they were declared the victors, you know? Still had 19,000. Uh, the Australian government had supplied farmers with ammunition and even created bounties for hunting emus, like for emu, emu no, hunters. That's insane. That's insane. In 1934. Can you imagine? It's like, where's daddy? Or like, what does daddy do for a living? It's like, oh, he he's an emu hunter. <laughs> and, okay, so this happened, that, that became official in 1934, and within six months, approximately 57,000 bounties for dead emus had been claimed. Oh my god. Um, holy People were jumping on it. Mm. I mean, hey, I, I probably would too, like, shit. Mm. If you provide the saying, ammunition. I tried yeah. to see, like, what the, like, reward was for it, but I literally could not find anything. But I'm assuming it was a good reward considering how many people have made these claims. Yeah. Um, but this this one is, this you know, the Great Emo War, as wonderful as it is and horrible as it is at the same time, it is a little short story. Um, so no, I do want... It's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, but... It does end off good for the emus. In 1999, Ooh. 
wild emus in Australia became formally protected by the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Conservation Act. So, yeah, they're they're not protected. And hopefully they're not destroying crops. Good. Emus are cool. (laughs) Yeah. I I actually looked up a bunch of fun facts about emus, too. What's what's your favorite? Um, they have, I don't, you guys probably know this though. I think this is pretty well known. Maybe the listeners they have. Yeah. In case anybody Wait, what? doesn't what did you know, say? in case anybody doesn't know, they have two sets of eyelids, one for blinking and the other for keeping dust out. Whoa. What? Oh. Yeah. I didn't know Wait. that. Is it, is one, is the dust one like a, it's, it's like thin and see-through or like, um, yeah, well, it, the 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 one that's for blinking is for kind of, kind of, but you need that thick skin to get all the dust out. Yeah, I did uh, not know that. That's cool. See, don't don't assume that we know this fun facts. You're right. My fault. Yeah, I'm they not also that are, smart. They they, <laughs> they get from ten to twenty years in the wild. They can grow up to two meters tall. And, and uh, for us Americans, awesome. how much is that? Uh oh yeah, you're so right. <laughs> um, six feet. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, too tall so for like, a bird. That's pretty tall for a bird. Well, they have long ass necks, well, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel like half of their height is like their neck and their legs, or most of their <laughs> yeah. yeah half of height their height is their neck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um. But yeah, that's that's the story of the Great Emu War of Australia. Hell yeah! Thank you for educating you us. Thank thank you for listening. I know thank it was you. short. <laughs> it was a story, and it was a war. <laughs> yes it was so did any like people get hurt or injured during the emo war good question oh, and she her. disconnected <laughs> she had no answer she's like bye <laughs> yeah she's like no I'm done <laughs> I'm finished <laughs> yeah okay she's back hello hello, hello? Hi. I was Hello. just asking if you do how many, if any people got injured during the Ebon War. Um, there's no reports of people getting injured, but there are reports of like when they use the trucks that they go to crash in them. <laughs> okay, no, I'm sure. They okay. just run over the emus. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, but there's no reports of anybody like being killed or injured, which oh, is well, that's good. I guess the emus had the most casualties. Yeah, those poor emus. They're just trying to live la vida loca, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Bruh. Oh, well, thank you. Just yeah. like Josh. I'm Anderson. sorry. <clears throat> okay. Em- <laughs> emo war is in the books. Yeah, emo war. <laughs> no, that's still yet to come. <laughs> <laughs> the great emo war. Yeah, I literally loved researching this. I was that's so I, fun. Yeah, it was so fun. I knew, I knew that it was gonna get pretty dark, and so I was like, I need to find like a case that's like respectfully funny, you know? Ah, okay. Yeah. Wow, you really didn't have hope for us having a good story that was not dark. Well, it's a good story. I, <laughs> you know, it's yeah, just yeah. you know. I feel like mine was a good buffer. Dark. It yeah, was. yours was, was like was in the middle. Story. Yeah, I liked yours. <laughs> I didn't like the teacher marrying the student. Yeah, that's no. the worst part about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, besides, I feel like that's a crime on its own. No, definitely not the worst part about it. But yeah, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Weird. Well, episode six in the books. Yeah. Episode six. Woo! If you're listening and you're here at the end after two hours. Thank you for sticking around. Yeah. Thank you. Follow our, our socials. Jay, what plug are it. our socials? Oh. Plug what? The socials. The I know. <laughs> yeah, check our socials, our Instagram, 
Facebook page, TikTok at Chambers of the Occult. My if space. you have stories you would like to check, if you <laughs> have stories you'd like to recommend, email us at chambers of the occult at gmail.com or feel free to check out our website. We have two forms there. You can submit your listener stories if you've ever had something paranormal or a brush with true crime and you would like to talk about it, you would like to share it with us, feel free to send yeah. it in. We'll read them for you. Or if you'd like to suggest a story, like last week, Kai did a uh, listener yeah. story recommended, The <clears throat> Ant Hill Kids. What if, if we get like, if we start to get like little suggestions of like quick stories that people have had, like their own experiences, we could like read them in between our stories that we say Ooh, or something like that on the podcast. I like that. Like I if they're just like short, do... like quick little stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking we could do like a bonus episode for those. Oh, that'd be cool too. Like like yeah. at the start of the month or at the end of the month, we'll just read oh, like yeah, three yeah. or four stories okay. each. Let us know what y'all think. Like how yeah, how yeah. would you format that once we do get enough suggestions? So make yeah. sure to send them in, please. We need to Please send them in. We're I, we know you have that. them. We know you're holding back. Yeah. <laughs> Don't hold back. Yeah. Well, thank you for listening and we'll be back next episode. With more yeah. stories. Thank you guys. Episode six Thank in you. the books. Yes. Have a Bye-bye. good night Have or day. Night. Time Damn. here on Earth. Make it worthwhile. <laughs> Have, Have a great Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.